Yeah, thanks a lot for this nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about um, neural radiance fields and how to use them for real-time rendering in game engines and for web applications. Maybe a very few words um, from uh, the company or the institute that I'm coming from. So we are located in Erlangen, close to Nuremberg. Um, yeah, in the meantime, we have a lot of uh, locations uh, where we have teams, um, so I don't go through them. The biggest one is in Erlangen, and I'm coming from the division that is working on audio and multimedia. And um, many, many people in our team are working on audio codecs, 3D audio, spatial sound, transmission, um, this kind of things, rendering. But we have also a team for video because normally uh, audio also needs to have good video and that's what we are responsible of, or I am responsible of with my team. And that's what I would like to talk to you today. Namely, um, the question how to transform photos into photorealistic representations. And we will start with a motivation and see a little bit the broad landscape. Then we look to the principles of the main technology that I will consider today, namely the neural radiance fields. And then the last part will be the question, okay, once we have created them, how can we play them back? How can we integrate them into game engines? So all these kind of applications have in common that you need to be able to virtually walk in a 3D representation of a scene so that you can walk left and right and top and bottom and also turn the head in all three directions. That's why we call this six degrees of freedom. And on the right side, you see more applications where you could imagine to use it like archival documentation, um, entertainment, like movie production, uh, e-commerce, planning and simulations. So there are many of this um, kind of applications where this technology is related. Maybe you associate these technologies with VR, but it's not only about VR. And to show you, um, uh, here you see a comparison, um, how a human being observes a scene when he has motion parallax. So normally what we, I would need to do is that I give you a scene and you move, but I can't control your movement. So, and I didn't want to destroy the projector here and move the projector. So what we did is we simulated it by having a screen here, and on the left side, you see what happened if you would, would move uh, in front of the screen without any 3D information of the scene. So you don't have this motion parallax. You see the butterflies are not shifting relative to the flowers, and it looks very flat. And I hope you agree that on the right side, although you see it on a 2D screen, it somehow looks 3D. So this technology is not only relevant for VR, of course, that's a good or great application, but you can also benefit from in 2D screenings, uh, screen settings. So the task that we have is we have an object or a scene, we capture a number of photos, and then what we need to do is we need to be able to interpolate between these views so that you can virtually walk in a position where you don't have a photo, but still create the right perspective. And to do so, there are a couple of aspects that you need to solve. And this is, you will see why there's a big ecosystem of technologies that all contribute to this task. So the first one is obviously, I talked about it, is you need to have some form of 3D information. You need to have this motion parallax. You need to know where objects or objects parts are located. But that's not all. To be really photorealistic, you also need to take into account that if you have shiny surfaces, for instance, and you move and observe this point that is marked by uh, this red arrow, you will see that it changes the color. This is the view-dependent appearance, and this is something that contributes to realism um, when you look to a virtual object. So given that you have different dimensions that you need to solve um, for this basic problem of six degrees of freedom uh, navigation. Uh, there is a huge set of technologies that you could rely on. So on the left side, I sketched 
just a selection that's even not complete here. Probably we can make two talks only about this. Um, so we have sensors that are emitting some form of signal uh, to recover geometry or to get the uh, reflectance properties of your materials. And then on the right side, you see the sensor techniques that just take the scene as is the, the illumination that you have. You take captures, photos, whatever, and you try to reconstruct then geometry and texture. The most well-known is uh, multi-view stereo or photogrammetry. That's what is typically used today. And since recently, we have these new irradiance fields that show to be very promising and where I will focus to um, today. So what are the principles of these new irradiance fields? Um, the principle is that you consider to have a, a voxel grid, so a, a three-dimensional grid of small cubes, and each of these cubes can have a color and a density. A density gives you an indication whether there's free space or whether it's completely opaque or whether it's semi-transparent. And then um, you have your photos, and for each pixel, you shoot a ray into this voxel grid, and you want the colors and the density in the voxel grid in such a way that they exactly reproduce the pixel color that you have seen in your photo. And you do this by heavy um, optimization. So you have a physically correct rendering model, and then you use massive optimization to find out the values of your uh, voxels and uh, the, the colors. And this got possible by the uh, great progress in machine learning because first of all, this made all these heavy optimizers available and we need this heavily. And the second point is that in reality, you don't store uh, discrete or normal colors and density in the voxel grids, but often you use neural representations. So you have, for instance, more than three color channels, and this is what we call neural colors, and then you transform these colors into your representation. And this is shown here on, a, on a, this principle, um, the algorithm principle. So you have, again, this ray, you sample the ray on different <coughs> positions. You can see it doesn't need to be equidistant. That's quite a sophisticated um, design where to place your samples. So you sample this voxel grid. And then at each voxel, you store a, a vector, a feature vector. And this feature vector is translated by a multilayer perceptron, so by a neural network, into color and density. And the uh, more opaque your object is, the more contribution your color has, so somehow you multiply those together, and then you add them up. It's a little bit simplified, this equation is a little bit more difficult, but that's the, the main principle that is um, happening. So if you compare this to photogrammetry, then you will see that it, it's working quite differently. So in photogrammetry, what you do is you also have multiple photos, so you have the same starting point, but then you are looking to correspondences. So you try to find a point in the left image and in the right image, and for instance, if you take the point that I have again marked with this red arrow, you will see that this is quite difficult. A human being has some intuition, but for a computer, it's quite hard to see which points match exactly because they're looking so similar. And this causes that you get wrong correspondences and leads to noisy and incomplete uh, point clouds. And these noisy point clouds you have to fix afterwards and that's where all the difficulties come and why um, sometimes your uh, photogrammetry results are, uh, have errors. So, the difference is really that in photogrammetry, you optimize for matching costs. So you try to, to match corresponding pixels. You only have a single depth value per pixel. So you compute a depth map once you have found the correspondences. And this means that you can't support transparent surfaces because transparent surfaces, a pixel sees objects in different depths. And then normally you only get a Lambertian texture. So this view-dependent appearance that I have shown you with the car is typically missing. So it's a more geometry-driven pipeline. So you first try to reconstruct the geometry and then you add on the visual appearance in form of texture. And neural radiance fields 
go the other way around. You optimize directly the visual appearance. So you try to fit the voxels such that it looks as similar as possible to your photo. And this is why normally you have better uh, visual quality and it also supports semi-transparencies and is viewing dependent effects because the colors, in fact, they can change depending on the viewing angle. It's encoded in this voxel field as well. We will see later on that the price you have to pay is that geometry extraction is maybe a little bit more difficult. So it's a little bit different use cases or main purposes, let's call it that way, that follows the two. So here you see a comparison, our early results that we had at the very beginning, uh, also to show you a little bit the progress that happened during the time. So what is happening here is took a lot, lot of photos, and then we did the reconstruction with a photogrammetry software that is visible on the right side, and we did um, voxel-based uh, reconstruction on the left side. And then we rendered this model in such a way that we had a true photo also available. So we render the position with the true photo, and now we flicker between the two so that you can see the differences. And on the right side, you see that this is uh, the, the silhouette of the object is not nice. So there were wrong correspondences, and this is not something that you would like to have, for instance, in e-commerce, because this doesn't look like the real product. You would need to fix it. On the left side, um, the silhouette is much, much better. You see that the texture is still a bit blurry here, and you will see it's, uh, we progressed on this quite a bit. But overall, I would say this is more what you can present to a customer than the, the, the right side. You can go more to the extremes. So sometimes if your object is really difficult, then it almost misses completely, while the neural radiance field uh, gives you a better appearance. But you already see here that it's also not perfect. And I come back to this point, what is the challenge in the neural radiance fields and why they appear here, these this artifacts? Before that, uh, another example where you have very fine-grained details. This is also something that is very difficult for photogrammetry and mesh-based approaches. You again see it's not perfect in the neural radiance fields neither, but it's much better, so it's going in the right direction. So um, from this, I hope that you see that, yes, it's looking promising. The photo quality is good, but you have also seen it wasn't perfect either. And uh, the reason um, for this is that, yeah, no technology is without any uh, disadvantage. <coughs> and the challenge in these neural radiance fields is the size of the memory and the compute time that you need. In photogrammetry, you basically work in the beginning at least, you work based on depth maps. And depth maps are two-dimensional images, so you have a complexity in the order of n to the power of two. And the neural radiance fields work on voxel grids, so you have three dimensions, meaning that you have a complexity uh, with a power of three. And of course, this is painful for your memory. This causes that you cannot just make the voxel grid as large as you would like to have it, I mean, if you can make it as large as you want, then there wouldn't be an issue. But you need to start to trading memory against um, photo quality. And this is what makes this workflow a little bit tricky to get the, the good results. The second point is that um, you really directly rely on the outcome of the optimizer. So in, in photogrammetry, you find corresponding matches, you find a minimum that's rather straightforward. There are more advanced algorithms where you also use optimizers. But here, you only rely on the optimizer. And if you have tried to work with optimizers, you know they don't guarantee you to find a good um, solution. And this is the second source of um, problems that can cause that your result is, is not um, perfect. And the last part that we shouldn't forget is that yeah, most pipelines today, they work on, on meshes and geometry, while these voxel grids, yeah, they are quite different, and it's a break in the workflow that you also need to, to handle somehow. So what we need to do is, to solve this, is that you really need to have good parameter heuristics for your algorithm to really tune this, this trade-offs and this parameter. We also learned that it's very important to have clean and consistent input data and camera parameters um, that you need. And then you need a clever reconstruction um, methods to really get 
a stable result. And that's what we are working on to rebuild our pipeline and try to make this as robust as possible. If you are wondering now what's with the geometry, for this we did also a corresponding test. So this test was a little bit different. We took a blender model uh, in, in a motorcycle in blender. We rendered all the photos um, and then we simulated the reconstruction. And given that we have the true blender motorcycle with all the geometry, this time we can flicker between the geometry. And again, um, on the right side, you see the photogrammetry uh, geometry. And on the left side, you see the voxel geometry. Both of them are not perfect, but I hope that you agree that the left one is better than the right one. If you see the windshield, for instance, or the mirrors. Also, you don't want to, to ride the tires of the right motorcycle. It will be very bumpy. On the left side, it's, it's much, much better. We also had to learn, however, that it's not always like this because as said, neural radiance fields are optimized to generate good visual appearance and not good geometry. And later on, we found many examples where the geometry was not good at all. And this brings me to the next question, namely how now to integrate this into today's pipelines uh, that are essentially in most of the cases geometry driven. Because the problem is that voxel rendering is slow. Remember, we, we shoot this ray for every pixel. We have to intersect all the voxels. We have to see the density. We have to accumulate everything. And that's slow. That's much slower than um, at least um, a, a projection driven rendering. It's more, it's more similar to ray tracing here. So there are tricks to speed this up. You can skip empty space. You can stop uh, assembling rays if you see that you have seen an op park object and many more. But still, um, it's not the same because neural radiance fields, as they don't optimize for geometry, they tend to have some cloudy surfaces. So still, you have to consider multiple voxels. You don't have discrete geometry, and this means at the end of the day you have to render multiple voxels per pixels, which, which slows down the process. So what to do? Well, obviously you can try to get, create a faster renderer that is more optimized. You can develop new rendering libraries. You can hope for new hardwares, and I guess they will come at some point, but this of course takes time, um, and it's not a solution for right, uh, right now. The other extreme is you say, okay, I know that the geometry is not good, but still I try to convert it to, to meshes. But what we observed is that you lose a lot of your visual fidelity because you change the rendering principle and you lose a lot of information and it doesn't look the same. So then people came and said, okay, um, then we need to optimize the mesh in a similar fashion. So we optimize the mesh that the rendering look similar to the photo. And you can do this, but this is a very hard optimization problem. Um, the gradients are not super well defined. So um, to make this happen into practice probably will still take a little bit of time. You can try to combine nerves with this geometry idea by, for instance, uh, injecting um, sign distance fields and then putting constraints on the geometry. This can be done. Um, they are harder to converge, uh, like the neural radiance fields, and normally they don't support transparencies, but this could be an option uh, that, or direction that you can go, um, although you maybe not have the same visual fidelity than the ones that I have shown you. Um, what recently appeared in form of this Gaussian splitting is that they somehow use different rendering primitives, so this is, can also be a direction. Um, but it's still a, a, a different pipeline. It's not geometry driven. It's more point cloud rendering, um, more or less. I mean, you have some Gaussians around them, some primitives. So you still need a new rendering pipeline. And that's why we opted um, for what we call voxel meshes. So voxel meshes, you have a mesh, but you interpret them in a more generalized way in the sense that you don't expect them to perfectly match the geometry of your object. It's just a rough um, approximation. And then you have a neural color that you put on top of it. 
that does the rest. So that fixes the, the deficiencies. And this is what you can see here. So here you, you maybe recognize the police car again. We constructed such a voxel mesh and we imported it into Blender and here you see it without a neural texture. This is like, it's looking so strange. You can roughly see that yes, it's a police car, but this is not uh, what you would like to visualize, of course. And the rest is then fixed by this neural renderer, so this MLP that translates these neural colors into your RGB colors. And here you can see an example. So this is a, a different object, it's a toy car. On the left side you see the voxel mesh again, so it's hard to see. You can see, ah, the toy car is probably here we, where we have this pile of, of um, planes. So this is a plane-based approach. Uh, for the voxel mesh. And on the right side, you see this voxel mesh in action when, when being rendered with the neural texture. So it looks like the real toy car. And the pipeline is, uh, you, you are still very close to the traditional pipeline. So you have your geometry, which is coarse. You have multiple textures, so not only RGB, but you have neural color texture, you have an alpha texture. Then you use the traditional uh, mesh projection in your game engine or whatever. You get what we call a neural image. So this neural image is still looking a little bit strange. It has the wrong colors. And then uh, you use your neural network and you translate it into a final image. And so the benefit is that you really can reuse most of your pipeline that you had used before. And that's what we did then. Um, we decided to create a, a plugin for Unity to really show that this is possible. And we have two variants in the meantime. So the first one is what we call Unitorch. So in this Unitorch plugin, we took the, the core library from one of the machine learning frameworks, so from PyTorch, we integrated it into um, uh, Unity and use this library to execute this MLP, so this translator network. And the benefit that we have from this solution is this PyTorch, LibTorch library is highly optimized, so you get very good rendering speed. And we did it in such a way that you can interfere with different passes in Unity so that you can also control shadows if you want to. Um, the drawback is that you are somehow platform dependent because you have this C++ library from your machine learning framework. And even if you want to change uh, between the Unity rendering pipelines, it's a hassle because they were completely different and you have to readapt your API. So that's why we said, okay, we will use a complementary approach um, where we restrict to shaders only. So we realized this MLPs by some shaders that we apply in Unity, and that's much easier to convert to different applications. And one of the extensions that we recently made um, is also for a web application, uh, which I will show you immediately. First of all, this is the rendering in Unity, a video of it. Um, so you see that uh, you can uh, virtually walk around this object. And the frames per second are maybe hard to read, but for this object size here, yeah, it's between 300 and 400 frames per second on a 2080 uh, Ti GPU. So that's something where you can start with. And as mentioned, um, let me just, where's my mouse? Given that we have this um, shader variant, you can also bring it to your um, to your browser, so this is now running on this laptop here. It's not a super fancy laptop and the GPU is just a built-in GPU, but still this is sufficient to uh, virtually um, chain, uh, move your position, zoom in, zoom out, um, and see the object from, from different um, perspectives. And this is possible by using um, the web GPU framework, which is quite powerful, and there you can make a lot of um, nice um, renderings. So, um, the last point that I would like to quickly mention is that um, given that you rely on this um, basic mesh representation, you can also use editing tools 
that you know um, to manipulate this one. So here, for instance, uh, we have created some processing graphs in Houdini to make a cabrio out of our uh, toy car. So we have this, you see this blue box, and this blue box essentially cuts parts of this voxel measure and then it disappears. And this looks again a little bit strange because it's just a, a preview, the, the, the voxel mesh without a neural texture. So it's just for editing. But when you put this back into uh, Unity and apply this neural uh, shader, the neural renderer, then it looks again um, nice. Um, what you want to have. So um, if this is something that you think um, could be uh, valid for your application, then please contact me because we are also part of a network called XR Interaction. This is a, a networking um, alliance that does research for XR te technologies and applications and builds uh, publicly funded projects together and it's open for new complementary partners, so there could be different ways of collaborations if you think this technology could be something, because we try now to bring this into application together with industrial partners. And there I'm at the end. I thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions.